am your host, Galit. So a little bit about me. I know about Doctors for Dancers. We first connect connected because I'm a certified personal trainer. But the way that I got into that in the first place, fitness, was I have 20 years of experience in dance and I continue to grow with it. I'm a choreographer for the WNBA Sparks. I'm still actively teaching dance, mostly hip hop. Word. Um, and a couple of things. I, I'm the host and creator of the Dance Speak podcast. So we have 125 and more episodes with unfiltered stories and lessons from thrivers in and around the dance world. I also have an upcoming for dancers and non-dancers looking to keep all the muscles engaged and cross-train. I have an upcoming fitness program starting in December. It's virtual training. It's videos you receive every other day, less than $3 a workout. So if you're interested in that, Doctors for Dancers will put my info in the box. Doctors for Dancers is an organization. They connect fitness professionals, medical professionals that specialize with dance, with dancers. As you all probably know, for better or for worse, if your specialist does not understand the needs uh, the, that you have as a dancer, it can be quite detrimental. And if they do understand, then you can really excel in your artistry. Okay, okay, okay. Awesome. And I am seeing Doctors for Dancers. I have <laughs> a different intro in front of me. Um, that is Perfect. Okay, first. So I'm actually going to, before we fully kick off the straight to the point, we wanted to start with a little teaser for our next upcoming program. This is going to have to do with a, a prevalent topic that's quite not the easiest to talk about, sexual harassment in the dance world. And we're going to have on December 3rd, December 2nd, we're going to have it for dancers and parents. And December Third, so December 2nd and December 3rd, we're going to have it for everyone else. So Leslie Scott, if you could come on real quick. Leslie is a dance educator, founder of YPAD, and she was an active professional dancer with 20 years in Los Angeles. So she really knows the dance world through and through. She's going to quickly go over this upcoming, um, this upcoming Zoom program that we have. Hey everybody, welcome. Thank you so much, Galit. So um, yes, on December 2nd and 3rd, um, we are going to have two separate webinars, one for students and parents and another one for teachers and studio owners to kind of tackle the education of um, sex abuse and dance. Um, we're gonna kind of dive deep and those, I, I see actually some people in here that attended the Youth Protection Advocates and Dance webinar that we had a couple of months ago. Um, but we're going to be talking about objectification, sexualization, um, how artistic um, choices, developmentally appropriate choices impact those things, um, consent, boundaries, what is grooming, um, internet safety, because obviously a lot of us know that dance is online now 24 seven. Um, and then we're going to have an open Q and A so we can engage more on this topic. Um, you know, this is not something specific to dance. Um, you know, abuse happens in all youth centered activities. But one thing that is specific to dance is that we do not have a government body or any type of regulatory agency that ensures that us as educators know what a mandated reporter is, how to take a disclosure. Um, so we're going to be diving into those topics just so if this ever does come knock at your door that you feel equipped um, that you feel like you have community that you have support um, so that again is going to be December 2nd and December 3rd and we really look forward to spending some time with you then awesome thank you so much Leslie and just a little bit more um, housekeeping so we have our last workshop and it's up on YouTube. So you can also catch the videos from our, our previous workshop on the YouTube channel. Also be sure to check out www.doctorsfordancers.com. So you can find your specialist from our directory, physical therapist, general practitioners, chiropractors, athletic trainers, personal trainers, Pilates specialists, yoga teachers, and many more. Anything can happen in an eight count. So if you are a teacher or a studio owner, this is a great opportunity to use class time for an educational class and share this great education with your students from our dance specialists. And you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out some of our great workshops and classes we've put on Doctors for Dancers. 
at the end of the workshop, you know, we're so happy to provide this to you for free. If you um, feel it, we would love any testimonials that you have. If you don't mind creating one for us, tagging us on Instagram at Doctors for Dancers, we will end properly at properly at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So we really we appreciate it if you're interested in doing that. And without any further ado, I'm going to start with the introduction for both of our perfect with both of our specialists. We have Dr. Amy Martell. She has her doctorate in physical therapy and opened her own practice in 2012 to focus on helping dancers prevent and heal from injuries. Her practice operates within the Ballet School Performing Arts in Walnut Creek, California. Amy is also a certified progressing ballet technique instructor and enjoys offering this valuable conditioning program to her students and patients. So please keep up with her intensives and teaching information. Next, we have Josephine Lee, who, Josephine, I had no idea. You also went to USC. Do we know each other? Did we meet 10 years ago? Yeah. Um, fight <laughs> on. We know each ago. other? What? <laughs> I graduated 10 years ago, so maybe. <laughs> whole conversation rabbit hole I want to go in right now. I will not, but we have to talk after. So after graduating from USC, Josephine recognized a need for better access to proper point shoe fittings and started a traveling point shoe fitting company called The Point Shop. Pulling from both her dance and fitting experience, she developed a fitting method that analyzes the dancer's technique and skill level with a focus on health. I mean, I know I went too far too fast when it came to upping my level, which wish I had, had met you and time traveled for that. Um, awesome. So we would also, last thing, we would love to know if you want to message us or anything, what kind of workshop you would like to see next. And... Doctors for Dancers, let us start. All right, so Dr. Amy, I'm calling you Dr. Amy. I know I can call you Amy, okay. but I think I'm gonna probably call you Dr. Amy this whole time. That's fine. So I, I know that you had a presentation ready for us. Should we dive yeah. in? Let's do it. It's so nice to have you here. here. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay, can we see that? Yes. All right. Um, so thanks, Galit, for that intro. I'm Dr. Amy, I'm a PT. I'm going in 14 years now. Um, and about eight years ago, I opened my practice um, to the point physical therapy, actually from within the studio that I grew up dancing in. So it's a pretty fun, um, unique setting for me to be in. And it allowed me to really um, connect with the dancers and the teachers, not only from that studio, but from all the studios around the Bay Area. I'm up in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. Um, and so by being in this setting, I was able to kind of approach um, the point readiness as, in a different way. Um, and we decided a couple of years ago to kind of revamp the approach we were taking um, at the studio to point. And so I'm happy to share that with you today um, and let you know what's working where we're at. Um, and so the idea with the point readiness assessment or the medical point readiness assessment is safety. And that's always the primary goal um, is to avoid as many injuries as we possibly can. We can't avoid all injuries, but there are things that we can do to um, mitigate the risk as best we can. So at the very least, starting point before you're ready can be um, frustrating. Um, and at the worst, you get injured while you're doing it. Uh, so this gives us an opportunity to identify any um, risk factors that can contribute to future injury. So it's important to note um, that going from demi point to point puts a much different force through your foot. So when you're just up on the ball of your feet, you're going about four times your body weight through your foot. You put your foot in a point shoe and now that goes up to 12 times. So it's really important to have adequate strength and range of motion when you're going into point shoes. Um, so right now there's not a standardized screening for point readiness. 
Um, there's some really great research happening and hopefully eventually we'll have a more standardized test. Um, but for the most part, I think we're all looking at about the same thing. There's a lot of PTs that do these assessments, chiropractors and some um, medical doctors as well. And so a comprehensive point readiness assessment is going to start with a health screening. We want to know generally um, your health history. We want to know your dance history. How long have you been taking with styles and that kind of thing? And we want to know injury history, previous injuries, current injuries. Um, we're going to check range of motion at hips, knees, ankles, toes. It gives us an opportunity to check for symmetry between right and left side and see if there's anything going on there. And this really is an opportunity for us to, um, to connect and go over goals that the dancer might be working on that, um, that year as well. We're gonna check strength, we're gonna check balance in multiple different positions. We'll look at technique um, and we'll check for flexibility and check if there's any hypermobility that we need to be worried about. Um, we'll look at alignment and then dynamic strength and control through more complicated movements. So, there are a bunch of things that we look at, um, but there are some components that for my assessment, the dancer absolutely must pass. Um, so I will go over those today. And my intent with this is not to teach you how to perform the assessment, um, but just give you an idea of the components of the things that I'm looking at. Um, and so the single leg sauté test, you've got to get eight out of 16 with uh, good form on each side. The topple test is just a single, clean, controlled outward pirouette from fourth position. The airplane test, you've got to get four out of five in good uh, alignment. Pencil test with long toes and 25 single leg elevates. So we'll go over all of those. Okay. So the single leg saute, um, I took the pictures here in parallel. Uh, just because it's easier visually to see. But we're going to look at the jumping alignment in parallel and turned out. So you can see um, that here on the left, her hip is hiked and rotated, her knee is dropping inside her big toe. Oftentimes, we'll see a little wiggle on the landing or the takeoff of the knee, um, indicating a lack of control there. And this picture on the right, she's in much better alignment. Um, hopefully you can see that okay. Her, so her knee's tracking right over the center of her foot. Her hips are nice and square. I'm looking to see if the dancer can stay in the same spot, more or less on the floor, or are they moving all over the place? Um, can they point their foot under them? And again, this one, uh, you only need to get eight out of 16 with good form. It's a pretty difficult test. Um, and a lot of times I'll use the slow motion function on my camera phone, uh, my phone, um, so that the dancer can really see what I'm seeing because it happens pretty quick. So slowing it down can be really helpful here. Okay, this is the airplane. Um, this test actually gives us a lot of information. And so if I notice any, anything funky happening with any of these tests, it's an opportunity to back up a little bit and kind of tease out what the underlying cause of that is. And then that can help me um, give the dancer some exercises to work on at home. So the alignment here is really critical. Um, and it throws you off a little bit when you're looking at the floor and not straight up. And so that's why the dancer is looking down at the floor here. It takes that visual input away. So you can see that her hips are rotated in this top picture. Um, we're looking to see that the dancer can keep a nice square hip or are they compensating? And again, with the knee alignment on this one. So she's going from straight knee to bent knee and that knee is diving to the inside of the foot. She's not controlled there. Um, and then from the side, we're also gonna look and see, can the dancer keep that back leg up? Are they in a nice straight line from the tip of the head to the tip of uh, the back toes? And so these pictures in the center here are in much better alignment. Here's from the front with the bent knee, tracking straight over the center of the foot. And the dancer's gonna start with their arms out in a T, and then as they bend the knee, the hands come together, fingertips come together, and then they straighten and come straight back up to the T. So here's from the side, that's at the end of the movement. 
Um, and then this far picture over here is the starting position. So and the a hips quick are question to the floor. Yes. About the airplane, do you, yeah. what are your thoughts on having progressions either on releve or having, I'm um, forgetting what it's called, an unstable, but what is uh, an unstable block? I forgot mm -hmm. where it has cushion. I'm blanking on the word for it. What are your thoughts on those progressions? Um, so you mean doing this test in an LFA position? So when you have, let's say you're doing this test because this can um, double for stability and strengthening. Yeah, yeah. What would, you, yeah, like is, so maybe a better way to put it, is there a progression for this if you find, oh, wow, this is really helping me build muscular balance and stability and challenge. Would you recommend a progression? Yeah, so um, you guys should try this one at home. It's very difficult to do this correctly flat on the floor. Um, but if it ever does get easy, you can certainly put yourself on a more unstable surface, um, folded up yoga mat or one of the dyno discs. Um, but it is pretty difficult. Even once you get your point shoes, just doing this in a point shoe because it's much harder to balance in a point shoe than in a soft shoe, um, that could be a functional progression as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, it does. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, this is a pretty tough test. Okay. Um, the pencil test. This is another one of those absolutely must pass. Um, and I think it's pretty obvious why. You can see in this picture here, she's curling her toes um, and there's a gap in between the pencil and her ankle. So this is showing me that she would not be able to safely get over the box of a point shoe. She doesn't have adequate ankle range of motion there. Um, and then in her fully pointed toes here, as you can see the, the pencil's nice and flat. She's got more than enough range of motion and her toes are nice and long so that they're not gonna crunch in a point shoe. Have you and ever seen, oh, sorry. <laughs> this is an easy self-assessment too. This is kind of a nice place to start. Have you ever seen it where somebody's just anatomically, they just don't have enough of an arch to ever do point? Um, unfortunately, yes. Occasionally there are, there are skeletons that just won't allow it safely. Yeah. It doesn't happen too often. You can usually do some exercises. Um, this might be a good opportunity to, to talk about those foot stretchers. Um, People have deep opinions about these, but I generally don't recommend them. Um, just they can create instability in the foot. So when we see this, this foot to the left here, um, there are things we can do safely, strengthening the foot um, through range of motion, general mobility drills versus shoving your foot into some kind of passive foot stretcher that's just going to overstretch things um, and you won't be gaining the control of this new range of motion, which can also set you up for injury. So there are safer ways to gain your as much range of motion in the ankle as you can. Thank you. Okay. Um, 25 single leg elevates, and we added this after some really great research out of the Australian ballet. I know we've got some people here from Australia, so thank you. Um, so they started incorporating this into their training and had about a 70% drop in foot and ankle injuries um, if the dancers could do at least 25 single leg elevates. So this is definitely a component of my assessment, and I think most people's assessments. Um, so what we're looking at here is can the dancer keep their knee very straight? Um, they're going through their full range of motion all the way up, all the way down. She's not pressing into the bar. So you can practice this standing on a wall too. So you don't have something that you can push down into or just make sure that you're keeping very light pressure through the fingertips. And she's able to maintain a really nice um, neutral spine alignment there. Compensations um, or when the dancer starts to fall apart with their form. She's still all the way up on her heel here. She might be down a little bit more. They might start bending their knees to get up or really pressing down into the bar. So those are all compensations there. You're gonna look for at least 25 and that's on both sides. Um, this really takes time to work up to. So I'm gonna give you some exercises in a minute uh, that can help you work up to this 25 single leg elevate test. Austrian alignment. Um, 
So it's really important that we respect the dancer's natural anatomy. There are some things that really shouldn't be forced um, because they just create compensations in other areas and can set the dancer up for injury. So all the way to the left there, she's got nice neutral pelvic alignment. She's not over rotated in her feet. She's using what she's naturally able to achieve. And the two middle pictures are the opposite extreme. So she's anteriorly tipping her pelvis, she's dipping down. Um, and then here she's tucking her pelvis. And we're gonna look at alignment in uh, center grand plie. Can she keep neutral spine? Are her knees tracking over her toes? How's her balance? Okay, so dance teachers will be very familiar with these um, positional faults here. So all the way to the left, we've got a sickle length foot. And I drew dots on our ankle here. And this is something that you can do um, if you offer a point prep class, which was a component of restructuring the, the point readiness, um, the way we get into point readiness at uh, the ballet school performing arts. So we added a point prep class and the student is expected to be in that class between six and 12 months before being invited um, to do the point readiness assessment. And that's been really consistent with coming to class about once a week. Um, and so they really focus on alignment in the foot here. And it's an opportunity to maybe take the shoes off and do more of a barefoot bar. So the dancer can draw a dot in between, um, right in the center of the ankle, and then right in between the second and third toe here. And using the mirrors, they can see the alignment. So here we have a sickling foot you can see that the dots are not stacked on top of each other. Um, and this is an opportunity for me to see, are there any uh, mobility restrictions, especially at the big toe, which is causing this compensation? Does the dancer have um, a history of ankle sprains, that kind of thing? In the middle here, we've got nice good alignment. You can see those dots stacked right on top of each other. And then on the right here, we've got a winging foot. So we're gonna be concerned about hypermobility here. Does the dancer really have control of their foot? Um, and with both of these two positional faults, it's indicating a lack of muscle balance. So we're really looking at, does the dancer have muscle balance between the inside and the outside ankle muscles that are gonna allow her to track straight up and down safely over the center of the foot? So long toes are really important. Um, you're putting your foot into a point shoe box. You're not going to be able to crunch your toes. So does the dancer have control and strength in the foot, keeping the toes nice and long? Um, this particular dancer has almost a fused big toe, so she wasn't able to show me a very good compensation with crunching into that big toe. Um, so oftentimes you'll see even more of a clawing here, but you can see her little toes are curled with a tondu. Um, and then here, she's able to keep them nice and long. And this is important. Okay, so moving into some corrective exercises or supplemental exercises, these are also things that you can include in your point prep class if that's something that your studio offers. Um, if you can't control the foot in single leg, Right now, these two exercises to the left can be nice places to start. So we just got a lacrosse ball here, a pinky ball in between her heels, and she's rising straight up and down. And you can imagine that if she sickles one or both feet, that ball is going to drop to the floor. So this can be nice tactile feedback to work on alignment, especially for dancers who might be prone to sickling. Um, here we're using a mini band, or you can use any band that's tied in a loop. And uh, this is gonna work the opposite ankle so that the dancer is pushing out gently or they have something to press into and that's gonna work more the inside of the ankle. And again, with both of these, we're looking for nice neutral alignment. It's just gonna bias the muscles a little bit. So we start there. Um, and then once that gets easier, or once you use that as a warm up you can do single leg in the same way. So here we've got a band tied around the dancer's ankle um, 
and it's either out to the outside or the inside and with the intention of strengthening so that the dancer can go straight up and down. And is it a problem generally if you do have longer toes for point? Are you more likely to get injured or do you have less potential perhaps? That might be a loaded question, but. Um, so by long toes, I mean not curling your toes. Ah, okay. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, so, so are you initiating your point by curling your toes and then pointing your ankle or are you able to really articulate through the foot and keep those toes nice and long so that your foot is nice and strong um, as if you're in a point shoe because you can't curl your toes in a point shoe. Yeah, and we so. did have the question, so it may have been with a misunderstanding, but the question yeah. was if you do, so still, if you have naturally long toes, like a really prominent big toe, like I have, is that yeah. a problem for point? Um, it can be, and Josephine, I'm sure we'll talk about that. There are different shapes of feet. And so there are things that you can do inside of a point shoe, adding a toe cap um, and some other padding issues that yeah. you can help to kind of, to adjust for that. but. Yeah, usually there are things you can do in, in a point shoe to help with the skeletal anatomy. Awesome. And two more quick questions before we move on, because I know we need time for Josephine, but good questions. Where is the band tied to and where did you get that tiny ball? So that's just a lacrosse ball and you can get it at any sporting goods store. Amazon, I'm sure has them. Um, or even a tennis ball would work. It's just something to give the dancer some feedback so that if they do sickle, the ball would drop to the floor. Um, what's the other question? Um, where is the band tied to? I know you just oh. need a strong fixed point. Yeah, so this is a, attached to a pole. Um, if we someday can all take classes together, you can tie the band in between dancers so it could be attached to another dancer. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, but if you're at home, a table leg is just fine. You can also tie a knot in one end and close it in a door jam. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so foot intrinsics. Um, you've got intrinsic and extrinsic muscles in the foot. Uh, the extrinsic muscles are the bigger movers. The intrinsic ones are gonna start and stop within the foot. So they're really important tiny muscles for foot articulation and stability, okay? So the... Uh, splaying of the toes over here. I call this twinkle toes. Some people call it toe swapping. But here, um, the arrows are indicating that she's trying to spread her toes out. Okay, so separate your toes and then bring them back together. Separate them, bring them back together. Um, and this is actually, these are really difficult exercises and impossible really to see when your foot is in a shoe. So uh, the point prep class should be done in bare feet. And then uh, if you don't have a point prep class, an opportunity every once in a while to do a barefoot bar um, is a nice way for the teacher and the dancer to see the, the foot alignment and the toe positions. Um, so she's splaying her toes. That's a really good intrinsic exercise. And then here the toe swapping. So pressing the little toes down while you bring just the big toe up and then switching, pressing the big toe down while you bring the little toes up. And it's very difficult. It's more of a brain game really than anything, um, but it can be kind of a fun exercise for the dancers to work on and really functional. So doming a short foot, I will give this to most dancers. Um, you're going to try to shrink up your foot like you wanna wear a shoe, but it's like a half size too small. But you really wanna wear these shoes. So that's what you wanna think of when you're shrinking your arch. Um, and you're just lifting up this arch. You know, a lot of dance teachers will give the cue to lift your arch. Um, and that's essentially what we mean here. But you're gonna do that without rolling the foot out. So you're just trying to shrink your midfoot, like your knuckles of your toes back towards your heel, just a few millimeters and then relax. Um, it can be helpful when you're learning this exercise to do it with your hands as well as the feet. Um, and that can help facilitate the right muscle movement for both feet together. You can work on this while you're brushing your teeth a couple times a day, just integrate it into your day a little bit. Um, but do not roll your ankle out. It's just a shrink up like a suction cup away from the floor. Um, and FHL strengthening. So one of the more common dancer injuries um, is to the flexor hallucis longus 
muscle, okay? Um, and that's one of the main muscles that will get you from demi point to point. So it's really important that this muscle is nice and strong. Um, so you can tie a band around your big toe and you just let the big toe come up and then firmly press it down to the floor. And you can incorporate the short foot into that movement as well. Uh, and this is just a variation that I like of the really common TheraBand exercise. Usually you just tie it around the midfoot or the ball of your foot and go up and down. Um, and I like running the band down the back of the leg and up and over. I feel like it gives the dancer a little more feedback to pull in those intrinsic muscles of the foot. So you're gonna flex your foot back as much as possible. And it's really important that the dancer knows that they're flexing their ankle back, not just the toes. So energy out through the heel, pushing it away and really trying to flex that ankle. And then can you keep those toes up while you point just over the ankle? And then the last bit is you draw the toes down without crunching them. Try to keep them nice and long and then reverse the movement back up. So this is just an option for the, the pointing and flexing um, exercise that a lot of you, I'm sure, are already doing. Okay. And sideline leg lifts. So this is where I will start for the dancers who are having a hard time with the knee tracking over the toes or over the center of the foot. Um, and once they can kind of access this muscle easier, we'll move to more functional exercise, but this is a really good place to start. And it's pretty difficult if you do it correctly. I recommend doing it um, with your back to a wall. So your, your leg's gonna be back behind you like in a tondu type of range of motion. Um, and then the walls there just to give you something to slide your heel up and down to make sure that you're maintaining that hip extension range of motion. So you wanna make sure that your hips are stacked right on top of each other. They're not rolling forward or backward and that you're stable in through your core. Um, you're gonna rotate your heel up towards the ceiling and just draw the foot up and down. And you should feel a pretty good burn on the back side of the hip pretty quickly if you're doing this one correctly. And again, that's to help with your knee tracking. Thank you so much. I know that we have two more slides. Um, We'll have to go in like 30 seconds over to Josephine. Okay. okay. So last one, uh, recommendations for studios. So it was really helpful to offer a specific point prep class and it gives the younger dancers a sense that they're working toward moving into point shoes because it can, you know, it's an important milestone for them. Um, and then don't advance the dancer just based on age or years of training. Those are oftentimes the markers that we use um, and that don't, those don't always indicate proficiency. So having these more objective measures is really important to make sure that you're moving the dancer onto a point when they're very safe and strong. Um, and the parents do appreciate having these uh, assessments done. Um, and then dancers, just make sure that you're advocating for yourself, speaking up if something doesn't feel right, or if you have questions about what you can do um, to strengthen to get ready for a point, ask your teachers, or you can uh, reach out to PT, you can email me, the website's here at the bottom. Um, and then make sure that you're getting professionally fitted for at least the first few pairs of point shoes and definitely after any injuries. So those are my references. Thank you okay. so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I know this is so much information, everyone. And it again, is so much. <laughs> it's so much. It's like filling years and years and years of experience and specificity. And the whole idea of this really is to, to introduce or to freshen up, you know, your knowledge and have these conversations because we also probably have experts in the audience. Um, and to let you know these resources are available to you. So before we move on to Josephine, we're going to have a really quick poll.
All right, and I'm seeing some people in the chat box that the polls are not letting you submit. Um, the first question, studio owners and teachers, do you provide a pre-point program to your students? Dancers and dance parents, have you been provided a pre-point program at your studio? Oh, and I have an Amazon. Thank you, delivery. This is real. <laughs> studio owners and teachers, do you recommend a point readiness assessment before starting your dancers on point? Dancers and dance parents, have you been given a recommendation to get a point readiness assessment before starting on point? I know I didn't back in the day. Three, everyone, have you worked with a dance specialist like a physical therapist that helped you in pre-point or on point? That's the dream, it's awesome. Okay, and four, everyone, have you worked with a professional point shoe fitter at your studio? All right, we are done. Um, okay, so Josephine, hello, hello. Hi, how's it going? It's going good. Well, it's going well, everyone. Proper grammar, come on. Um, so you had a video to share with us, right? Actually, I'm gonna use a couple slides instead because I think that it'll be better for me to explain it. Not a problem. And Alexandra, really great question. Again, we have, um, we're going to mention it at the end, but we have an Instagram takeover. So it's going to be um, on the Dan Doctors for Dancers IG page next Thursday, the 19th at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So we still have 20 minutes and a wealth of knowledge, but please know that if anything does not get answered, we also have that opportunity. Okay. <laughs> All right, Josephine, I'm ready. Okay, perfect. So how, let me share the screen and I'm going to jump back in and out. So if you guys can, and I can also see your chat box as well. So if you guys have any questions, go ahead and ask those questions and I can answer them as I go through them. Okay. Awesome. And I'll All help right. with that. Perfect. Thank you so much. And let's see if we can just share. Okay. So this is a very, very general, um, this is very general point you fitting 101. Um, the way that point you fitting has always been uh, done before is just by shape and size. So I'm gonna go over really quickly. I think most of you are dance teachers or dancers. So you basically know all of the parts of the point you, but I'm gonna go over that with you really quickly. So you know the terminology. So if you guys can see my screen, let me know. Okay. I think you can see my screen, yes? All good? All right, so here's the point two. This is gonna be the vamp right here. The point two has two parts, the box and the shank. Those are the two parts. And those are the two that you need in order for you to go on your toes. This, in the box, you have the vamp, the wings, and you have the platform right here. That's where you, that's where you balance. And then the shank can either be a full shank, a three-quarter shank, or a half shank. They all look pretty much the same. Um, a three quarter shank doesn't look any different than, than a full shank because there's two parts of the shank. There's the outer sole and then there's the inner sole. So the outer sole is usually pretty intact unless you, unless you have one of those split sole ones, then the outer sole is split. The inside sole is going to be a little bit softer in this portion if it's a three quarter. And if it's a half shank, it's gonna be soft until here. And if it's a full shank, then it's gonna be hard all the way through. Um, there's also what's called a demi point shoe. Those are not real point shoes, but um, they look just like a point shoe. Just the inner shank is missing. So you just have the outer shank. So it's super soft and you can really articulate through your feet and they're not made to really be danced on point. So we're not really gonna be talking about that, but if you're interested or if you have any questions about that, I can address that really quickly at the end. Okay, so how the point shoes were fitted previously in the past. These are all different types of shapes of feet. 
um, you're going to see a lot of these. Um, everyone has different shaped feet. And this is the general five, but there are actually thousands of different types of feet. So if you all can just take off your socks and take a look at your feet, you might even notice right now that your left and your right might be two different types. So different, different types, and it's generally more to do with the length of your toes and um, how tapered they are. But the two general types are tapered toes and non-tapered toes. If you have non-tapered toes, you have pretty much three or four, five different toes that are the same shape. Um, if you have really tapered toes, you have a big difference between your longest toe to your second longest toe to your third longest toe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think Dr. Amy had, um, when she was talking about the long toe, when you point, she, her dancer only had her big toe straightened. I bet you she, was, she had pretty tapered toes to begin with, so her big toe's a lot longer. Now, depending on how tapered your feet are, you're gonna have a different shape shoe. So I have two shoes that are pretty much the same size, um, but you can see that this box right here is a lot more square and it accommodates more toes at the toes touching the very end, as opposed to this toe right here, it's a little bit more tapered, so the end of the shoe is a lot smaller. So depending on how many toes you have that are the longest, you can have either a square shoe or a more tapered one. Now that's very, very general. Um, most people will fit you uh, according to your feet shape. I focus a little bit more on your technique, so, I work with Dr. Amy as well as other doctors around the country that work with dancers. And depending on what you are working on, let's say you are working on strengthening, let's say you're working on um, your ankle flexibility, um, you're working a little bit more on balance, you're a little bit less aligned. So depending on your good and bad habits of what you do, um, that's the type of point to you that I'm going to offer to you. So let's move on to the type of point shoe, um, I see. Oh, we can't see the shoes. Also the- Are we um, having some issues? The presentation, if you could share it with full screen. Okay, so everyone, yeah, they just needed to have the view to speaker. I'm gonna see if I can spotlight you. Um, you know what, I'll, I'll actually come back at the end after it, cause I only have a couple slides. Okay, so I'll talk about the slides and then I'll come back so everyone can see me and all the point shoes, okay? So we'll- swap in and out. Thank you for letting me know, you guys. Um, the demi point shoes, I will also talk about the demi point shoes at the end. Okay, so point shoe fitting as a tool. So all of those exercises that Dr. Amy was showing you today, these are all done on bare feet because we wanna see what your feet naturally do. When, you're put, when you put your point, when your feet inside your point shoe, your feet do drastically different things. All of a sudden you're scrunching when you don't scrunch when you're flat. All of a sudden you're knuckling, all of a sudden you're doing all of these different strange things that you didn't do. Or if you're sickling or if you're beveling, you're, um, it's a lot more obvious when you're, when you're on point. So like Dr. Amy said, there's a lot more weight going down to the base of your body when you have point shoes on. So when we're doing a point shoe fitting, I have to determine what is the most important thing? What is the most dire need? Let's say that a dancer is pretty flexible, so she's getting over her box, she looks great, but she has really weak ankles, like the lateral muscles that we were talking about earlier today. If you're a little bit weaker on one side or the other, if I give you a shoe that is not supportive enough, or if the shape is not correct enough, you're really going to be pushing on one side. And the problem is, when your shoe is brand new, you can't really see, you can't really tell, um, if you're, if you're leaning towards one side or another, you can only start to see your really bad habits once the shoe starts to die. So I have to kind of see your old shoes as well. So we kind of look at all of your good and bad habits and, um, and that I try to determine what the most important thing is in order for you to, um, in order for you to be safer, in order for you to get stronger. So let's talk about a couple of different things. Um, I'm going to, uh, Let's talk about dancers who are going on point for the first time. 
I take a look at their feet and I analyze what their given bad habits are and also what they need to work on. So if we're talking about safety versus strengthening, a lot of dancers, when you're going on your first pair of point shoes, I'm typically looking at um, say, uh, typically looking at more on the softer shoe size because if they're especially younger and they don't weigh much, I really want them to be able to strengthen your, their feet by rolling through your feet, making sure that they're getting over their box. They're really, um, they're mostly at the bar, so I'm not as worried about them being on center. However, if I have a dancer who is so flexible and uh, they're rolling over their ankles, then I have to determine that um, safety is a little bit more important. You see those dancers in your ballet class with these beautiful feet that just bend in half. Um, sometimes they will come back with a point shoe that doesn't look good on their feet. And you're like, how is this possible that this gorgeous foot can go into a point shoe and all of a sudden it doesn't look very good? And that's because we have to give them a shoe that was a bit harder so that uh, the shoe is kind of propping them up a little bit so that the dancer is not going to injure themselves. So I'm trying to see the range of how strong a dancer is and determining the strength of the shoe, depending on if they need more safety or a little bit more strengthening. Um, strength versus flexibility, we talked about that a little bit. So I also take um, most dancers that are super, super flexible, it's a little bit more difficult for them to get something that is, um, uh, that it's a little bit more difficult for them to build strength if they're just really, really loose. So while they are very lucky that they have these beautiful feet that are super bendy, um, they also have to be really careful because they're slightly more injury prone. Um, look versus need, that's another thing that I determined, to, um, I take a look at too. When we're fitting for performance, when I'm fitting for competition, when I'm fitting for an audition, I'm looking at the aesthetic of the point shoe, how pretty the shoe is. But for the most part, if you have months and months of none of these activities, I'm really just trying to get you either stronger, more flexible, um, help you with alignment. Um, all of those things are a little bit more important than what the shoe looks like. So sometimes I will send you with a shoe that isn't as pretty, but it'll help you in the long run. Okay, so here's a photo. And there's a sorry, there's such a good question. I know we're 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 tight on time, but is there a weight limit for point show a point shoes too heavy, too light? No. Okay. There's no weight limit, there's a strength limit. Ah. So if you're not strong enough, because I, I fit men all the time. Men are, you know, these guys can be two hundred pounds, two hundred and fifty pounds, whatever it is, but they are um if they're really, really strong then they're able to pull themselves out of their point shoes. If, so if you are talking about weight, it needs to have, um, you need to balance it out with strength as well. Um, if that's not there, it doesn't matter how light you are or how heavy you are, if you don't have the weight that can accommodate it, then that's a problem, but there's no limit. That's a great question. Thank you for asking. No problem. Um, we have I'll, some, I'll, sorry, we have some really please. good questions, but I wanna make sure that you get through your slides first in case they're getting okay. answered that way. This is, this is my last one. So let's just do this. Um, you see oh, your point shoes, your dead point shoes, um, give me what I need to give you the next shoe. So this is a dead point shoe that has, um, she's actually floating. You can't really tell from this shoe, but um, her toes are not actually touching the floor at all because the shoe is too tapered and the foot is coming out of the shoe. So we have to give them something not only wider, but something with a wider base so that she can actually go straight down. So if we had those little dots, you can see that her ankles are actually pretty well aligned, but her foot is spilling out of the shoe. So what happens if that's the case? If you're floating inside your shoes, you're actually very, um, you don't have a lot of base. So uh, it's a little bit more unstable. So you want to make sure that you're already doing that. So this is a hot spot right here. Um, a, a shoe that's incorrectly fit, you can also see that they're not well aligned as well. And then this one goes straight down. So you also, you want to make sure that your foot is straight inside your shoe. Sometimes it is the dancer's fault where they are actually sickling or beveling or doing something funky. But if it is the shoe, then um, it, it might lead you to learn a lot of bad habits. 
So you have to be careful with that. When I look at pain assessment, the reason why I don't want you to feel a lot of pain on point is because I'm not just trying to be nice. It's because when you're in pain inside your point shoes, you start to do these really strange things. Like you subconsciously try to take pressure off of whatever is hurting and you start to teach yourself these bad habits on point, like misalignment. You start to um, uh, balance in the wrong spot, things like that. So you want to make sure that the shoe is fitted well enough so that nothing is really hurting and also that you're not doing funky things and learning bad habits in them. Um, I, like I said before, I work with a lot of doctors and Dr. Amy, I work with quite a bit. Um, you, you can have a problem and I can help you the best way I can with the point shoes. But if you are missing some of these elements, then I'm not going to be able to help you. I can only give you the shoe that fits you correctly, but you have to be able to, you have to rest. You have to have a dietitian. You have to have a PT. You have to have cross training and you have to have sprung floors. You have to have all of these things that can help you um, stay safe. So it's not really like a one person solution type of thing. You have to really take things holistically. Um, so yes, I am, I'm so sorry. I, I'm done with the screen sharing. So I'll stop share. Can everybody awesome. see me now a little bit better? Yes. Yes. And, and there's a question actually that might work for you and uh, Dr. Amy. I saw a question earlier about, is there a way to train yourself so that you don't get bunions as you mature? Amy and I will have, um, you need both. So there are exercises, but if but point shoes should not give you bunions if you're fitted correctly. Mm. It's actually easier to fit a point shoe than a regular shoe. Because look at how many point shoes I have. I have hundreds and hundreds of models. I have six different widths for one model. For regular shoes, you only have one or two. So I actually have a lot more options for me to keep you safe. So if you're fitted correctly in point shoes, then you shouldn't get a bunion from the point shoe. If you're doing something incorrectly, then you can. And that's where Dr. Amy comes in. Yeah, I would also say that you can definitely predispose yourself to a bunion if you are not ready for point and you go on point and then are not properly fitted. So. Thank you. And, and then thoughts, Josephine, thoughts on Gaynor Minden for new students. Alexandra Bourne says, I've always disliked them as they are pre-arched. So the student has, doesn't have to work their own foot is hard, but I've had some parents pushing for it more because they tend to last longer and be cheaper. That's typically why I pull them out. They do last longer and it is cheap, um, cheaper for the dancers. Um, it's not necessarily because they're pre-arched because almost every shoe, this is a traditional shoe. This one's pre-arched. Um, almost every shoe now is created to be pre-arched so it lasts a bit longer. It's the material that's a little bit different. So um, let's say uh, Gaynor Minden is made out of a plastic material or like a plastic E material called polymer. And the shoe doesn't break down the way that a normal shoe does. So a traditional shoe, because it's made of natural materials, when you go, uh, the more you dance in the shoe, the softer it gets. And then you start to rely more and more on your foot strength rather than the shoe. When you have a brand new shoe that's super hard, it's going to pop you up like this. Um, if you have a Gaynor Minden that's way too hard, it's going to pop you up like this. So it doesn't matter if you have a Gaynor Minden or a traditional shoe. If it's too hard, it's going to pop you up. However, a traditional shoe will eventually get softer. A Gaynor Minden never does. So there's no progressively strengthening process like a traditional shoe does. However, when I have my professional dancers that have to buy their own shoes, um, my college students that have to buy their own shoes, a lot of dancers who have to buy a lot, I gave them a Gaynor Minden as well as a traditional shoe so that they can have both and they can work through both of them. So I typically have Gaynor Mindens as a backup shoe. I think that's fine. Um, the only way that you can get a, a traditional, uh, a Gaynor Minden to work with you is if you get something that is really that's soft enough so that you can roll through. So it is possible to strengthen your feet. It's just that most people won't do it. It's too easy to cheat. So they'll do that. And Josephine, I know you have a heart out in two minutes. Everyone, we're going to just go, we're going to go kind of right on time and then just stick around for like two minutes past 2 p.m. PST. Um, are bunion, I, I was so curious about this as well. Are bunions hereditary for both of you? Can you be predisposed regardless of the training or shoes? Like you're just going to get them? Yes. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And do you have a brand that you recommend for beginners? No. Okay. And is there, Dr. Amy, is, see, I, I said Dr. Amy the whole time. Is there training or fixes to help with an injury to the joint at the big toe slash foot juncture? Yeah, I mean, that sounds like something that should probably be assessed by a dance med um, PT physician. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, and there, this is a, a pre-submitted question. We love when you submit questions early. Um, should point teachers be teaching on point? Is it important for students to see the shoes in action on teachers? And if not, what other ways can a teacher show the articulation of the movement of the shoes? I don't, that's a tough question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to worry about the safety of the dance teacher too. So if the dance teacher is able to wear a point shoe safely and demonstrate, then that's fine. Um, some are, some shouldn't. Um, so I think you could use other students, maybe more advanced students to show the articulation um, if the teacher is not able to and use a lot of imagery and that kind of thing. But I don't think it's always totally necessary. And do you have a recommended percentage of growth plate fusion for point? No, and your growth plates don't fuse until you're closer to 18 to 20 years old. So that's not a measure that we look at. Um, and from what we know now, it's um, the growth plate fusion is not a significant risk factor for starting point. So that's not something that we do and you don't need to be x-rayed. Got it. Um, I see all these amazing questions popping up and I personally, when I'm typing in questions, I'm like, answer or else. But unfortunately we are at time. Please stick around if you're open to providing a testimonial, I will cue that. Um, thank you so much, Josephine and Amy. And remember everyone, you can reach out to these two incredible women individually if you would like a consult, if you want more information. Um, some of these questions can be answered that way, including the one I saw about asking for a referral in New Jersey. And we have the Instagram takeover. So look at the chat box, check it out. We have all the information. This is going to also be up on YouTube probably in a week or so. So subscribe to the Doctors for Dancers YouTube. Um, my notes, my notes for the end. <laughs> subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure to share this. Follow us on Instagram. Um, yeah, and thank you. So please